Chapter 13. A week later, at a booth in Philadelphia's Tun Tavern, a signed letter from James Alexander sits on the table beside recent editions of the New York Weekly Journal. Two mugs of ale belonging to former New York Justice Lewis Morris and 29-year-old Benjamin Franklin are placed on the table. Every word from New York says these journals are true, says Benjamin Franklin. Nonetheless, Governor Cosby has imprisoned Mr. Zenger and attached bail conditions that are themselves criminal. Lifting his mug, Benjamin Franklin sips and then reads the rest of James Alexander's letter. Lewis Morris watches the patrons to see which ones pretend not to make eye, eye movement or listen from a distance. Finishing the letter, Benjamin Franklin needs only glance left and then right to know that all is safe for the moment. Telling the truth has never been a popular thing, says Benjamin Franklin. Rumor is the sheriff has employed deceptive measures to learn who authored the articles, explains Lewis Morris. Benjamin Franklin leafs through a few pages of weekly journals. I recognize the pseudonyms of James Alexander and Mr. Smith and, of course, you, Mr. Morris. When I spoke with Mr. Smith last week, he suggested printing news of this trial. Mr. Alexander concurs that the more alerted the populace, the less the government can persecute arbitrarily. Oh, I quite agree, says Benjamin, Benjamin Franklin with a nod. My friends here in Philadelphia will print by Thursday Eve. Did Mr. Alexander send you any transcripts? No, he did, replies Lewis Morris. He admits his reputation has caused difficulty in defending young Mr. Zager. He could play a spectator's heartstrings like a harp, uses uh, Benjamin Franklin. The worry is how he minces those who stand against him, admits Lewis Morrison as he watches a small, well-dressed man amble by. He has little use for subtlety. Did I ever tell you my brother James was arrested for libel, asks Benjamin Franklin. Why no, whatever did he print? A rather scathing editorial, replies Benjamin Franklin. He never forgave me for slipping it past him. Who authored it? asks Lewis Morris. Oh, I did. I was young, idealistic, foolish. Two of, those, two of those, I am no longer. You are only nine and twenty years, Ben. Look around the room, Mr. Morris, says Benjamin Franklin with a wide arm gesture. There are no elderly revolutionaries. Lewis Morris studies the crowd. True, these are young men. Surely you know the prosecution will, st will stall for more time to wear Mr. Zenger down. Lewis Morris nods. And that is the worry. Mr. Zenger has a wife and children. Much do they suffer for his silence. Suffering is widespread in every British colony, says Benjamin Franklin. While we would prefer to win autonomy legally, the histories of Ireland and Scotland show that force has often become inevitable. Lewis Morris muses and says, Perhaps we could set precedent on these shores and not use force. We would all prefer that, admits Benjamin Franklin. The Junto Club will meet again this Friday Eve. They would be interested in Mr. Zenger's case. And where will they meet? Pulling a shipping schedule from his overcoat pocket, Benjamin Franklin looks at the arrivals column and taps his finger halfway down the page. The Pontiac docks it Friday morn. After Customs has the day to search her holds, they will pay no further mind. We will be there at sunfall. I know that piece of harbor, says Lewis Morris with some concern. There are five British warships moored there. Certainly they will see us. <laughs> the last place they will suspect is neath their own sails. Lewis Morris shakes his head. This business of revolution is a younger man's venture, to be sure. Freedom is everyone's business, Lewis. Especially your grandfather. I have a friend here who can help you. Perhaps you know Andrew Hamilton. The prosecutor? Who better than, than a prosecutor to know your opponent's movements? Suggests Benjamin Franklin with a, with a mild smile. You and your friends work miracles to promote our cause. Benjamin Franklin eagerly leans closer. If you, wish, if you wish to witness a true miracle, wait till I tie a key to my kite. 
Lewis Morris cannot help but eye the young Benjamin Franklin as if wondering if he's going beyond the bounds of his usual eccentricity. Ben just points upward and nods confidently. Chapter 14. Nights later. Great clouds roll in followed by cresting waves and the snowfall that blankets the rooftops. A third British warship has taken position in the mouth of the harbor and charged with inspecting any ship arriving in New York. Every excuse is used to explain the inspections. Health and welfare, manifest check, search for stowaways, but the simple result is that the British are exerting pressure both on the water and in the city. Four passing redcoats do not even glance in the shop window at Anna standing alone at a work table. She rolls up fresh quills, a vial of ink, and uh, paper into a canvas bag and inserts the bag into a pocket in the lining of her long dress. Grabbing her black cloak, she quickly circles the shop and blows out each one of the wall-mounted candles before heading out the door. She looks around the shop and realizes that, that it is this silence that has been bothering her for the past hour which felt like 10 hours. Without John printing pages, drawing ads, and assembling finished newspapers, not only was the solitude horrific, but the process longer. She turns to the front door to see William Bradford standing on the other side of the glass. How long had he been standing there in the snow, she wondered, watching her look around the shop, lonely shop. Though suspicious of him and his allegiance to the crown, she opens the door. Anna. Mrs. Zenger, may I enter? Mr. Bradford. Well, in whose service do you come here tonight? asks Anna. Not in the service of the governor or the crown, I promise you. Anna notices that William Bradford does not wear the thin, smug, oppressive smile that she's witnessed among those in the service of Governor Cosby. She steps back and motions for him to enter. William Bradford enters the shop and breathes in the warm air as Anna closes the door loudly behind him. That much noise alerts Bradford that Anna does not trust him. I can see you were leaving, so I'll be brief, says William Bradford with a nod. I want to buy the New York Weekly Journal. That is out of the question, snaps Anna. You have deceived me and may now leave. William Bradford tries to salvage, salvage the situation. I am trying to save you and John. Do you understand what he is charged with? Yes, yes, replies Anna with an annoying tone. Seditious libels. I sedition, barked William Bradford. In other words, insurrection. In another word, treason. Treason, but we, don't you see, does not John Peter see, that the prosecution will couch this in terminology that will make a conviction palpable to the citizenry, warns William Bradford as he advances toward Anna. But in the end, his punishment will be for treason. Taken aback, Anna is speechless. Mrs. Zinger, I am your professional rival, says William Bradford plainly, but John Peter was my apprentice and personal friend for many years. I wish he and his family no harm. Please, let me buy your paper. I can give you enough money to go to Boston or Philadelphia. John may find a greater support for his kind of newspaper there. Anna looks around the shop and can only remember the immense burdens she's been under since John's incarceration. How easy it would be just to take the money, pay off the court officials, and move the family elsewhere. Perhaps even north to Canada, where the French might be more tolerant to John's critical nature regarding the British. But that would go against the ideals John has adopted from men who valued freedom over oppression. Justice over the wrath of the Star Chamber. To John, losing the journal would be like losing ground to those who did not deserve to take it from him. And she could not allow that. No, Mr. Bradford. John would never forgive me if I relented now. William Bradford is aghast by her tenacity. Do you realize the danger I could be in for merely speaking with you? Now, Anna, you must... I know he would never forgive me because I would never forgive him. I truly appreciate your concern, sir. My husband will as well. The Crown chose to abandon us in New York, and in New York we shall stand. Now, if you please, I must go. Anna moves to the door and opens it. The cold blows in. William Bradford nods defeat and walks out. 
She closes the door quietly behind him and breathes in the warm air. Staring through the front window, she watches William Bradford move down the block to be obscured by the wind and snows. Whom else was out there, she wondered. And were they watching? She was fatigued by the burden of running the shop, maintaining her, ch her children, covertly picking up articles and dropping messages to new friends, and performing her part in the idealist's plan. She was tired of hiding. She was sick of being a pawn. Yet she did not know or whom to know who or when to voice any of her displeasure. Knowing all too well that there were many others who'd suffered much worse. People she never met, but perhaps her husband did. So she killed the fire in the wood burning stove, blew out the last candle, and departed the shop continue her part. Chapter 15 In the candlelit courtroom Francis Harrison puts another log on the fireplace and holds his hands before the rising warmth. He looks back to see Richard Bradley put aside the court record he was reading and stare out the window. Something distracts you, asks Frank Francis Harrison. Richard Bradley sighs tiredly. There she goes again. Zanger's wife? Yes. Francis Harrison walks over to the window, looks down, and sees Anna running close to the stone wall toward the jail. He had forgotten how big she was. At least a foot taller than himself and capable of moving with an animal-like fluidity through the snow that prevented her from slipping. You see her go where she should not... And you never summon the guards. She must be suspicious of that. They suspect we are listening, admits Richard Bradley. Yet they reveal no more evidence than they do in motion. She speaks only of the children's grades at school, the weekly income, expenses, small matters, discussed by concerned friends. Zanger is smart, conjectures Francis Harrison. Perhaps he does, he does not involve his wife in the seditious acts. I might do the same were I him, says Richard Bradley, as he considers the complexity of Zenger's position. He needs her to care for the children. He won't risk her to do his dirty work. I've had his shop and employees watched. None of them do anything out of the ordinary either. Meaning what? asks Richard Bradley. None of his family or employees had contacts with suspicious persons. Richard Bradley watches Anna in the alleyway keying her way through the locked metal door and entering the jail. He sees her look back, then gently close the door behind her. What bothers him is what kind of tool she was using to invade their locked chambers so quickly. How many other places was she infiltrating around the city? Arresting her and relieving her of whatever she's carrying would answer his curiosity soon enough. But there was a larger picture. He wanted to know whom her husband was covering for. He looks at the clock on the opposite wall. These Germans are punctual if nothing else. And his anger is a Hollander, sir, says Francis Harrison with a slight smile. Richard Bradley angrily pounds the arm of his chair. Do not split hands with me, Mr. Harrison! Is what she is doing now a part of her daily routine or something more? He picks up pages of written reports and shakes them. The sheriff's report of ten days ago states that Zenger spoke with a tailor named McDougal. The conversation bordered on details most personal. Francis Harrison nods. We've been going about this all the wrong way, Mr. Bradley. I see your point. Task one of the guards to occupy the next cell. Have him gain Zenger's trust and then draw out the informations we can use against those whom Zenger protects. You mirror my thinking well, Mr. Bradley. Richard Bradley shoots Francis Harrison a look, then just smirks it as a wave of sarcasm sweeps over him. Oh, I'm overjoyed! Francis Harrison watches Richard Bradley stare out the window at the small footprints in the snow leading to the jail at the end of the alley. He is concerned by Bradley's sudden sarcasm, but he wonders for several seconds if it is his place to ask. Then, suspecting that any information gained from anyone might gain him leverage, 
He decides it is his place to know Bradley's moody thinking. Something bothers you? Richard Bradley nods slowly, tiredly. Zanger's wife, she risks arrest several times a month to see her husband for a moment. Just a moment, you understand. He did. Harrison does not know where Richard Bradley is going with this. So? Yawning, Richard Bradley turns to face Francis Harrison. Who would ever take such a risk for me? Francis Harrison glances out the window at the snow falling and filling in Anna's footprints. He sighs and slowly shakes his head before moving toward the door. I will, uh, I'll task one of the guards. Richard Bradley pays no mind to Francis Harrison as he exits. He stands there in the empty courtroom and can only ponder the usefulness of his life. He's played the game to gain the status that he lords over so many, and he did have his pleasure stepping on others' lives. He's done it for years without opposition. Had he and those he works for cooperated so well for so many years and stamping out so many lives that he has no thrill of the hunt of it anymore? For all the games he played, this one was emptying him. A printer who did not confess or reveal his co-conspirators was emptying him. A printer whose wife risks arrest and certain death has confounded him. Because for all the works he had done, no one was truly loyal to him because they wanted to be. They are only loyal because he could arrange their termination if they failed to carry out his whim. In this moment, does Bradley realize that he's won nothing? All these years of playing the game were nothing. And yet, if he stopped playing, the puppeteers would simply cut his strings, drop him into obscurity without red coat protection, and leave him to the mercy of the citizenry. So he could never stop playing until the mortal coil was ripped from his being. Such was his sentence, his conviction, his fate. Sitting on the edge of the bunk, John Peter Zenger draws a mountainscape on the back of his latest letter. He hears a familiar tapping at the door. As usual, he checks out the window to listen for a spy. Hears none, sees none. He heads across the cell and taps the door twice, indicating all clear. John, I spoke to Mr. Smith, came Anna's voice through the door. Is he filing his exceptions? He filed them two days ago, replies Anna. They expect treachery. The judges don't want a jury trial. Bastards! The trial is set for April 15th, says Anna in a calm voice. Three months! John could not imagine three more months jammed in his tiny, cold, stone cell. Twelve more weeks of his joints aching every time he stretched them. Ninety more days of choking down bad food, eliminating bodily waste in one bucket, bathing out of another bucket, and listening to prisoners being beaten and then dragged out for the last time. How long till the sheriff just came into his cell, had his red coats, beat him over the head till his skull caved in and made him disappear in a harbor full of skeletons? He doubts he'll last another 2,160 hours till April 15th. John, listen. The governor is selling the trial. Has the prosecutor tried to make a deal with you? Oh, yeah. I confess. They kill all of our friends. I get a fair trial. Then I disappear, said John Peter Zenger in a sarcastic tone with a shrug. I had to turn him down. John, don't be so cavalier. Listen carefully, Anna. Do you hear anyone else down here? They all confessed. They are all dead. All 13 of them? The man to the right of me went this morning. He tried to defend his farm after the governor tore up his deed, explains John Peter Zenger. He was sick of discussing the matter. He was fed up with waiting to be next. He was disgusted with the burden of it putting on Anna and his three children, so he changed the subject. How is Peter? I promoted him to copy boy, answers Anna. How are his studies? 
The schoolmaster says he will do well in history and writing. His accounting will well improve, says Anna. He's asking when he'll come home. What do I tell him? asks John Peter's anger as a knot swells in his dry throat. He's akin to a reporter. Never stops asking till he gets an answer. What do I tell him? I know you'll think of something. Reaching to his threadbare mattress, he opens the lining and pulls out a rolled up piece of paper. Place the paper over his knee. He dips the croquil pen into the vial of ink and goes to write, working, writing a letter to his son. How is the shop? Having a controversial and popular editor in jail improved circulation. I took on seven more advertising accounts last week, replies Aunt Anna confidently. Including the locksmith, he asks, realizing Anna must have had outside aid to infiltrate the jail and who knew well where else. He could not help but smile, realizing how well his wife was handling everything without being overwhelmed. And his brother the furniture maker, adds Anna. Seamus McDougall bought a quarter page ad. He's expanding his shop next year. I will need a suit, he says, noticing how his clothes are hanging off him. I've lost more weight. There is silence from the other side of the door. John continues writing the letter till he hears Anna sigh. She sighed when there was something she had to say, but didn't want to. She always ended up saying it. And even when she omitted something he might find distressing, he still managed to piece the picture together. Mr. Bradford expressed concern. He'd like to do something, but Francis Harrison, not hovering over him, he did not risk losing favor. William Bradford expressed concern. That meant he'd been in contact with Anna. He'd like to do something. That meant he might have given her some privileged information or tried to aid the family in some way. And it was all too obvious that William Bradford went out on a limb, even being seen on the same city block with Anna. If any of the governor's spies had seen Bradford, they'd have reported him, his strings would be cut, and the next day someone else would be running the Gazette while Bradford ended up in the next cell. Oh, God forbid he end up in the next cell next to me. Much I learned from Mr. Bradford. I regretted leaving the Gazette. I thought you left because you did not want any part of the Crown's lies, says Anna. I had argument with the Crown, true enough, admits John Peter's anger. But no grudge with William Bradford. He is a good businessman. Perhaps he lacks your conscience. Mm. So that is why the crown favors him so, conjectures the singer. John, you sound grim again. Do you need your Bible? Surely they would let you have that. He chuckles and shakes his head. No, 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 Hannah. Don't trouble yourself. I know, I've seen. What sort of God? favors. Anna, why do you suppose God favors the most insidious? Why do those favored seek to ruin the less fortunate? Is not God's favor enough for them? Finishing the letter, he blows on the paper to dry the ink and then rolls it up and slips it through the hole in the door. Perhaps God is testing you. Now she infuriated him. Then perhaps I will fail his test and spite him and his governor. John Peter Sanger, how can you be so blasphemous? He chuckles. You think me blasphemous, Anna? Let me tell you the crimes of the faithful. Two months ago, a Quaker woman was killed just because she saw God differently than the crown does. What makes the crown's version of God any better than hers? Is the crown justified because they have guns and a rope and she has not? Is the crown's justice the same as God's? Who dares to say so? John, never let anyone hear you. They can burn you for heresy. He circles the cell. How few steps it takes. Amazing how small his life has become just because some pompous fool did wrong to the public and he printed the truth about it all. And those same wrongdoers want to extinguish his life. Ridiculous. Anna, do you not see, can you not see the irony? When we have freedom of speech, heresy may no longer exist as a crime. Having a different image of God will become a right protected by law. 
This is the problem with prison. Too much time to think. Loud bangs followed by thumping footsteps and a pained yelp echo in the hall. The all too familiar sound of a prisoner being hauled in. Anna, the guards! Once again, he hears her move off. Seconds later, from the under, other end of the hallway, the door slams open against the stone wall, followed by more thumps approaching. The door of the next cell opens. Someone is thrown in, and the door slams closed. You go to trial next week, you bastard, yells Sheriff Symes. And may one of a god you preach have more mercy than the judges. Three sets of footsteps stomp back the way they came. The door at the end of the hallway locks shut. And all that is heard is the gasping and coughing of the prisoner in the next cell. Quietly sitting on the bunk, John Peter Zenger relaxes against the brick and stone wall and listens to the voice in the next hall. Is there anybody out there? There is a sound of a prisoner lumbering around in the next cell. Where is this place? Who are you people? I did nothing wrong. Why am I here? Yawning, John Peter Zenger pulls off his boots, places them beside his bunk and lies back to listen to the prisoner. I hear you moving. Who goes there? He missed Anna so much that his stomach was tumbling and he could barely keep himself from breaking down every time she had to flee. He had not had a conversation with anyone else since his last trial. And the human mind hungers terribly for the stimulation created by contact. And yet there was someone asking who was there. As if everyone in town had not yet heard he was in here. Then again, this prisoner might be from out of town. Whatever the possibility, he needed to talk. So he answered the prisoner's question with one of his own. You don't know. I know nothing. John got suspicious of the prisoner's tone and sarcasm took over. Oh, go on. You must have done something. Our distinguished courts would never throw away an honest man. Come on, fellow. Talk to me. You must have broken some law. Did you express your opinion against the rain and the snow? Read aloud from a book. <laughs> Ask God for a favor without leaving a down payment with your preacher. I, I'm just a writer. Amused, John Peter Zenger sits, sits, sits up in his bunk. Ah, uh, yes, a writer, a writer. Who are you? Do you understand the range of that question? Asks John Peter Zenger. Could you ask me my name, what I do, why am I here, and who are you? Um, Jones? He chuckles up his sleeve and smacks straw out of the nearly flat mattress. Is that Deputy Jones? Who goes there? No, 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 You sound too youthful to be Inspector Graves. So, so tell me, Jones, whatever do you write? Um, stories? Stories, amusing. What are they about, these stories? Asked John Peter Zenger as he went sarcastic yet again. Do regale me with fact, fiction, wit, wit, and commentary. What? What do you write about? Um, stories about growing up. This kid can't be 20 years old, thinks John Peter Zenger as he rolls his eyes and shakes his head. This should fill a pamphlet. Perhaps you mean memoirs. Do tell me one. Um, I wouldn't know where to begin. Amazing! A writer is at last for words. Tell me, boy, when did you decide to be a writer? I, I guess I was 21. I, I like to read. Thought it couldn't be too hard. Give it a go. You thought you'd give it a go, remarks John Peter Zenger as his ire raises. This guy's very presence was insulting. He hops out of the bunk, turns to the wall, takes in a very deep breath of the chilly air, and lets the volley fly. And what made you think you had a damn thing to say? Ah, uh, that is, I, uh, uh, 
What makes you think you experienced or thought or felt anything so worthwhile that you had to inflict it upon the literary community? Howls John as he clenched his fists. I, I, I don't understand why. You're damned right you don't understand. You arrogant whelp. Rising is like a sneeze that swells in your brain. If you cannot express your thoughts, your impulses, your ideas, then your brain, yes, your very being will detonate. John Peter's anger was on a rant now, and he was enjoying the tension release of it. All the times he wanted to howl out against the injustice, but he kept silent so as not to give the Redcoats the satisfaction. But here, now, the floodgates in his mind were blasting open, and he was letting it go and the damned horrific consequences that might follow. Ratchet chooses you! You respond as if to Claxon and put first the essence of pure thought. And tell me why you think you are a writer. Well, I, 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 what? Snaps John Peter's anger as he almost punches the stone wall. You, you can't talk to me like that. Oh no! Why not? asked John Peter Zenger with a defiant guffaw. Hey, if you be a writer, then relate what it was like the first time you kicked in a door, terrified the children, pulled the parents out of bed and shut them behind the ear. Uh, I never did. Damn, you don't lie to me. Tell me how you felt when you beat a confession out of a pawnbroker. Well, well, was it like that? It was not like that. Did someone say I? How long does it take the average Quaker? Tell me now. How long does it take the average Quaker to strangle neath the gallows? <gasps> of course, John Peter Zenger already knew the answer. He reported on too many Quaker deaths. How long are the ropes used for drawing and quartering? Ever drop someone into the harbor with rocks in their pockets? A deep, gravelly voice came through. You lousy, anarchistic bastard! Well, your vocabulary is improving already, says John Peter Zenger in false praise. He could hear an angry stomping echoing through the stone wall. Cat you the ribbons, oh will. Bayonet your neck to bollocks! More pounding and grunts echo. Oh, come now, Jones. Use your head. <laughs> More pounding and grunts echo from Jones. Yes, listening to Jones' rampage, he lies back on his bunk and smiles. He could not think of a more satisfying moment since before he was incarcerated. Yet here was a small victory in making his enemy lose control and lose at his own game. Yet despite feeling weak and cold due to bad food and little sleep, he still enjoyed a good fight. If those redcoats decided to rush in and do a four-corner waltz on the, on the cell walls. And I thought this was going to be boring, he says with a sigh and a chuckle. More of Jones' obscenities echoed through, but that only generated more amusement. What would that stuffed shirt of a governor do when he learned his puppet's latest plan failed to get results? Chapter 16. Pacing before his fireplace, Governor Cosby examines a March issue of the New York Weekly Journal while Francis Harrison briefs him. His frustration was all too evident in his stomping steps and the twisting sneer. Francis Harrison had rarely seen the governor this so incensed, and what was worse is that if he could not modify the politician's mood, his position and favor would be jeopardized. Nothing for the last two months have our deputies learned, reports Francis Harrison as his head bows nervously. This newspaper man accuses them of heinous acts, jabs them with innuendo. And whom informs him of these acts, asks Governor Cosby as he crumples the paper in his hand and shakes it violently. Surely he cannot pay for such informations. 
Perhaps the citizen, the citizen informs him. I have a spite for you. The Governor Cosby slams the newspaper on his oak desk. They all risk my reprisal. He slams the desk with his fists till he feels a quaking in his bones. Why do they not fear me? Before Har Francis Harrison can imagine a response, Governor Cosby kicks over the heavy desk. The papers that were upon it swarm through the air as he falls on his ass and clutches his wounded foot. His urge to curry favor, tell him to go to his governor, but fear, fear that he might get his face punched in, keeping, he's, he's keeping Francis Harrison standing motionless. Governor Cosby looks at Harrison with a boiling hate in his moist, quivering eyes. Don't stare at me! Damn it to hell, man! Tell me what to do! Sighing relief that the governor might not punch him out, Francis Harrison leans down, grabs Governor Cosby's upper arm, and struggles to stand him up on his unbroken foot. With a loud grunt, does Governor Cosby hobble over to his chair and plop down heavily. At this point, Francis Harrison's mind is already reeling to produce any plan that might improve his state with a physically and emotionally devastated governor. Mr. Governor... We cannot champion our cause by attacking pawns. Checkmate is accomplished by disposing of the opponent's upper echelon, beginning with the knights. Try as I might, I was never the soldier that Alexander and Smith have been. But, Your Excellency, no opponent ever challenged your lands, and so never had you to rise to the occasion. Don't sprinkle me with false compliment, Arizon! Smith and Alexander have made mockery of my course, my authority, my hold of the common rebel! Might their actions, their effect, be thus considered as threat to our security? Oh, they are that at least! They are at least a threat, snaps Governor Cosby. Then shall I task our judges with quelling the threat, asks Francis Harrison with malicious eagerness in his voice. With your permission, of course, Excellency. Governor Cosby waves him off with his right arm. Yes, yes! Be gone, Harrison! Grabbing up his cloak, Francis Harrison turns to go. But a second glance down has him see a recent New York Weekly Journal on the floor. And the words, Lost Puppy, on the page. He reaches down, snatches up the page, and reads it silently to himself. He'd never seen an ad for a lost animal in a New York newspaper before. Hearing a crunching sound, he looks across the room to see Governor Cosby rubbing his jammed toes. Oh, most unfortunate, says Francis Harrison as he holds up the page. Someone lost their prized cocker spaniel. And how do you know the animal was so prized if it is now lost? Excellency, the owner dressed the puppy in a plum paisley neckerchief and matching tan vest. Amused, Governor Cosby glances at Francis Harrison, who is also wearing a plum paisley neckerchief and matching vest with his well-tailored tan suit. Francis Harrison reads aloud from the article. It says the animal is most obedient, but has been lost since arriving on these shores. Francis Harrison watches Governor Cosby laugh up his sleeve, but cannot help but wonder why. The dog does tricks, rolls over, plays dead. Unable to contain himself, Go Governor Cosby snorts with laughter. Francis Harrison looks at his plum paisley vest touches his neckerchief, and then suddenly understands that the article, what the article truly means. Enraged, he casts the newspaper into the fireplace to incinerate. Roll over! Play dead! Francis Harrison trembles with rage and points his bony finger at the newspaper, burning to ash. Lousy, miserable bastards! Liking me to a lost dog, do they? I would have satisfaction for this insult! The governor watches Francis Harrison storm out of the study and slam the door behind him. 
He knew the little troll was beyond any rage he'd felt before and would now take all manner of action to get whatever gratification he could get. The governor could only sit there with his broken foot throbbing and shrug. Well, at least they did not liken you to a trained monkey. He didn't know if Harrison heard him or not. And he really didn't care. He lunges down, scrapes up several writs, warrants, and orders, and holds them in his trembling hand. Orders wrote on official tone, seals, signatures, and stamps. But still I am not just disgusted. Governor Cosby balls up and hurls the papers into the fire and pounds on his arms on the chair so his fists go numb. Dragging in a deep breath, he listens to the pounding sound echo out of the distance in the distant halls. He cannot help but realize that no one heard his tirade as the servants are all asleep in the small house behind the mansion. So, if a power-hungry despot goes on a tirade and no one hears it, did said despot do anything of value, or are they just going to go limp around for eight weeks for nothing? <laughs> Chapter 17. Peter tends to the fire under the stove while Anna enters the kitchen carrying two cuts of beef on a wooden cutting board. She glances into the tiny living room to see her younger children drawing and then goes to work slicing the beef. I'm going to the shop after dinner, announces Anna. Mr. Alexander left his articles about the tax increase. She just happens to glance at the dining room table to notice the newspaper sitting next to a chair. Then she goes to Peter. You finished it? That's the first copy, Mom, says Peter with a smile. You did this by candlelight? I ain't all the presses, re Peter replies. I set the type, finished all the ads, and Mr. Alexander's article. He writes good. Writes well. That too. Putting the meat on the counter, Anna turns to the table, picks up the newspaper, and then quickly reads through it. The columns are perfectly aligned. The inking is even, not too dark in one area or too light in others. Your father would be very proud. Very good work. When can he come home? Anna sighs. Peter, we've been through this. Been through what? You said he didn't break any laws. So how can they keep him and says what they're doing is right? Peter has an immense command of the obvious. Peter, see, law is like bad literature, explains Anna. Lots of people interpret it in different ways to suit their own purposes. If enough people believe one way, even if, even if it's an unjust way, then that way becomes the right way. Kids in school say their parents think we're unpatriotic. That we'd get along better if we just played the game. What game? Annoyed, Anna smirks. People have a peculiar definition of patriotism nowadays. Does your teacher have a favorite little student? Two, answers Peter. Billy and Lisa Holman. Tattletales. If they don't like you, they just make up something and the schoolmaster believes them. Even when what they say is a lie? Sure. Hmm. Well, Billy and Lisa Hallman are playing the game. And whether they lie or tell the truth, it does not matter. Damage done. Hey, you quick, you catch on quick, Mom. Anna reaches over to her long coat on the wall hook near the door and pulls the rolled-up letter from her pocket. Your father gave me this letter to treat you. Taking the letter from Anna, Peter slowly unrolls it and reads it to himself. Judging from the wrinkles, it must have been written months ago, and Anna had been holding it for when the time arose that she felt no, no longer able to explain the situation better. She also knew that once Peter had read the letter, he might get the impression that his father likely would not be coming back home. Peter, my son, your mother told me of your concerns. I am deeply concerned for you all. Understand that I am here because I broke laws that were unjust 
from precedents that were unwritten. That is the price for being honorable. You may suffer abuse, ostracism, and hard times. Never forget what we endure. You are becoming the man of the family as I did at your age. There is no tangible reward for doing the right thing. But how tangible is attaining heaven? Stay the course, weather the storm, and I'll be proud to call you my son. Take care of the shop till I return. Peter looks up from the letter to see Anna smiling with tears in her eyes. It is an uncommon sight to see Sheriff John Symes roving the streets without his two redcoats, but no one was going to walk up and ask him why. He turns onto Wall Street and squints as he stares into the morning sun shining upon him. Several passers-by pretend not to see him as they cross the street and duck into any alley or side street to avoid his seeing their face. Just to be seen by him, any place where a crime might take place guaranteed that he'd be kicking your door in before nightfall and hauling you off. Rumor about John Symes was that he was not interested in finding the guilty party. He was only interested in grabbing a suspect and letting the Inquisitors go to work, making the crime fit the punishment against whoever he grabbed. It was no wonder his arrest to conviction ratio was so high. But that was only a rumor. Anna sits in the tiny offices, rapidly counting the uh, income and Stowing it in the safe in the floor. She closes the hatch, locks it off, and shoves the rug over it with her foot. Putting aside the ledger, she peers through the bookshelf to see Peter and the journeyman setting the type on a page block. The front door suddenly swings open, the bells ring, and everyone turns to see Sheriff John Symes enter and eclipse the doorway. He slams the door behind him and instantly looks to the back door waiting for the Red Coast to bash it in and rush, rush through, jabbing their bayonets at her staff. I'm a singer! bellows Sheriff John Symes. Emerging from around the bookshelves, Anna moves toward the sheriff. I am she. Sheriff Symes forgot how big she was. He watches Anna glide across the polished hardwood floor past her staff and stand only a leg's distance from him. She stands with her fists on her hips, waiting for him to get rough with her. He is stronger and faster but, than, than, than uh, she, but her longer limbs give her more reach. And she, has one, she, and she was one of the few people in the city the sheriff could not look down on. I will speak with you regarding your husband. Anna smirks as if saying, Go ahead, don't waste my time. Noticing the eyes of the staff on him, the sheriff grumbles and continues in a lower voice, oh, I would prefer to discuss this in privacy. Oh, and would you prefer to thrash me about in my place of business as you did Paul and Eloise Birch? Asks Anna as she gestures to her staff. And without benefit of witnesses? I am here unofficially and without my guards. Anna nods to Peter, who looks scared. The journeyman nods back to her and then sneers at the sheriff as if letting him know he'll be waiting around in the next room in the event he misbehaves. He puts one arm around Peter and gestures to the apprentices, and they all vacate to the back room, leaving Anna alone with the sheriff. Anna gestures to the small office behind the bookshelves. It's the back office. The sheriff follows Anna through the shop and into the small office behind the tall bookshelves. Looking around the tiny office, the sheriff sees two chairs, a roll-top desk, and two oil lamps. Anna gestures to a chair, but he refuses with a single shake of his head. Nothing about this feels right to her. Why did the sheriff bring the guards? Why not have them turn the place upside down and look all over again for any more articles written by those sought for writing them? I would warn you, Mrs. Zenger, that I have been charged with discovering how you continue to run your husband's articles. Two men have seen you in the dark outside the jailhouse wall. In the dark? That is absurd. All manner of people roam the streets and alleys by night. I resent your insinuation that I might be one of them.
to you to deny it. And it says nothing. I understand that I'm trying to spare you your husband's fate. What you mean is that I will be only be safe if I stop printing John's words. Yes, replies the Sheriff Symes. You jeopardize not just your family, but anyone who would read your newspaper or pay for public notice in it. To do so brings the cloud of suspicion over them. I think you mistake your suspicion for the governor's paranoia, snaps Anna. Sheriff Symes is amused by her. Consider how a reader can be labeled politically unreliable just because they witnessed reading a scandalous sheet. Do you want to bring hardship on your readers? The journal reaches several colonies, replies Anna. What may be slanderous here could be applauded elsewhere. Then for the comfort of those in authority, would you sign off David to your loyalty to king and country? Anna is insulted. I would not. And I would ask, why not? Hypothetically, say I sign your document swearing non-hostility against the crown. Then a stranger libels me saying that I spoke ill of your governor, conjectures Anna. Would I be arrested and that document used as evidence that I broke contract with the governor? He was not ready for this. The sheriff thinks for a few seconds. Well, um, hypothetically you could. Anna decides to corner him with logic. Although you arrest me this moment for not signing the contract with the party in power. What assurance have I have against injustice? Your case would be made to the judges, rep replies Sheriff Symes. If you denounce those you know to be disloyal, then she's had enough of this. And what if I know no one whom is disloyal? Should I just lie against my neighbor who has done me no wrong simply to evade unjust imprisonment? Does not that endanger my neighbors and my readers worse than your cloudy suspicions? Thinking for a moment, Sheriff Symes removes from his coat pocket that affidavit with a royal seal. He unrolls it and eyes the words, loyalty, king, country, across the top. It has been an education, Mrs. Zenger. With that, he pulverizes the affidavit in his large hands, tosses it in the garbage can, smiles and steps toward her. Do heed my warning. Watch for those who watch you. Anna watches the sheriff turn and walk away. Standing in the door of the back room, the journeyman watches the sheriff walk with a slight bounce in his step, open the door and swagger out onto the cobblestone sidewalk. He looks to Anna to see her already looking at him. He just walks over a printing press, yanks down a lever and causes the tablet to strike a piece of 11.17 paper. Pulling the lever up, a freshly completed page one is revealed with a bold headline that reads, Zenger, trial continues. Chapter 18, Tuesday, April 15, 1735. Droves of spectators crowd into the courtroom and take their seats. Sitting at the prosecutor's desk, Francis Harrison has his back to the spectators, but listens in on dozens of hushed conversations among them. Finding a little of interest there, he glances toward the windows along the left side of the building where Anna, talking to the two New Yorkers, he is visibly disturbed that he cannot hear a thing they are saying. James Alexander William Smith conversed at the defendant's desk when the Redcoats flanked John Peter Zengar into the room. Anna looks to him, then back at the two New Yorkers as their conversation continues. Rumor between court reporters says that Francis Harrison tasked his minions to converse with your husband, says the second New Yorker. Disgusted, Anna looks at Francis Harrison. It is a cruel trick to isolate anyone for weeks and then send spies as company. Like 
likely he enjoyed the challenge, remarks the first New Yorker with a nod and a smile. Why, yes, adds the second New Yorker. Find out about the other fellow who's trying to find out about you first. Oddly enough, the longer John is incarcerated, the more the governor proves the evils of his administration true, conjectures the first New Yorker. Anna looks toward the rear of the courtroom, and she sees two more redcoats enter and stand on either side of the doors. Are they expecting trouble, or are they here to start war? She glances to the two New Yorkers. Are we safe talking out here in the open? The first New Yorker chuckles. Oh, they won't mind a newspaper publisher talking with a shipbuilder and a college professor. Sure enough, remarks the second New Yorker. It isn't as if we were armed radicals writing manifestos and practicing, practicing combat maneuvers in the woods. Anna sees the two New Yorkers chuckle and understands the humor in her worry. She glances to the rear doors to see William Bradford enter, nod to her, and take a seat nearby. Hearing a familiar footstep, she looks toward the bench to see the bailiff enter. All rise, howls the bailiff. The judges enter the room, and everyone stands till they take their seats at the bench. The bailiff unrolls a scroll, clears his throat, and deepens his voice. Hear ye, hear ye, by honor of our esteemed governor, William H. Cosby, this trial is reconvened to consider the exceptions of defense counsels James Alexander and William Smith. The Redcoats watch everyone take their seats. No one appears suspicious. They exchange glances as if warning one another to remain alert. Judge Delancey picks up his gavel and hammers it once. The court will hear your exceptions. James Alexander and William stand and face the judges. Your honors, it is our educated opinion that justice to our client cannot be served where judges are appointed at the governor's pleasure and without consent of his counsel, says William Smith as he gestures to the empty jury box. Therefore, we, we request trial by jury. The judges are exchanging grim glances. Slowly, Francis Harrison looks up from his tablet. William Smith looks to James Alexander with, with an expression on his face as if expecting an outrage from the judges. John Peter Zenger looks back to Anna, who looks more nervous than anyone. Dragging in a deep breath, Judge Delancey glances to Judge Phillips, but says nothing. He nods back. The court will reconvene tomorrow, reconvene tomorrow to consider, rules Judge Phillips. Then will you know our decision. The ju Judge Delancey slams his gavel. The judges stand up while the bailiff quickly takes the position before the bench. All rise! Everyone stands up as the judges file through the heavy every door and back into their chambers. They would not refuse, would they? asks John Peter Zenger. William Smith is confident. They understand that the law, the written law, is on our side. However, we are wise to expect treachery, adds James Alexander. John Peter Zenger smirks. I suppose having the truth on your side does not help. Whose truth? asks William Smith. John, you must understand that you and I, what you and I know to be the truth, is not what they view to be their truth, explains James Alexander. Justice isn't blind, gripes Zenger. She's bloody daft! The fact that the judges had not granted the jury trial immediately meant that they still had more art to play with the system, and that meant that John spent another night in confinement. As far as John could see, this was becoming a slow exercise in futility. No wonder so many finally gave in and confessed to high crimes. They did not even commit to end. It was just to end the long wait and bring swiftly a strangling death. However, he was not one to give these parasites the satisfaction.
It is nightfall and the lanky man is once again lighting the street lamps on the corner of Wall and Nassau streets. Standing on the front steps of the courthouse are Judges Delancey and Phillips, who converse with Francis Harrison. The few citizens passing by pay no mind to the trio and certainly offer no tidings of a good night. Agreed, Your Honors. The options are few so long as Alexander and Smith use the law with so much finesse, says Francis Harrison. Unlike our governor, Alexander plays well to the public, notes Judge Phillips. His every witticism recanted in the pubs, on the streets. In dark alleys, snaps Francis Harrison. His incendiary words widen the rift between the governor and his subjects. The same brand of rift that generates rebellions, suggests Judge Delancey. You suggest that Alexander and Smith are a threat to state security, asks Judge Phillips as his eyebrow twitches up. Threats unchecked beget rebellion, warns Francis Harrison. Rebellion gets revolution. I see your point, Harrison. And we will consider options adds Judge Phillips. In the meantime, Mr. Harrison, do aid Mr. Worrell in securing a reliable jury, suggests Judge Delancey with a nod. Francis Harrison watches the judges turn and descend the steps. Back in the courthouse, he be Harrison begins his walk down the block his darting eyes surveying the surly citizens that eye him with contempt as he passes. All of them are bigger and stronger than he. Out here in the dark, without red coat protection, he has no games to play. And if anyone passing by decides to insert a blade between his ribs, an eventual show of power, there is nothing he can do except try to breathe through a punctured lung before perishing in a pool of crimson on a, on a cobblestone. A chuckling sound behind him causes him to stop walking, turn suddenly around and see no one there. He looks ahead and hears whispering, whispering, echoing in the distant alleyways. Any number of people could be in there waiting for him, waiting to dismember him. If he cries out, he shows how afraid he is of the public and all the people who his games have wronged. If he stays silent and keeps walking, he might not make it to the end of the block. So he stands there shuddering in the dark and loses bowel control. Chapter 19, Wednesday, April 16th, 1735. Dark clouds nullify the few shafts of light casting through the windows of the courthouse and render it uncommonly dark for an afternoon. Judge Delancey stands as he addresses James Alexander and William Smith. It is the decision of this court that your exceptions be prohibited. Both of you stand to degrade, both of you stand to gain great applause and popularity by opposing this court. You have brought this dilemma to the point that either we must go for the bench or both of you from the bar. As such, it is the decision that you, James Alexander, and you, William Smith, be disbarred for practicing on the basis of contempt. Gasping, John Peter Zenger looks back at to Anna to see her shake her head in disbelief. Behind them, rows of spectators are shot to silence. James Alexander and William Smith look to each other and nod as if expecting this would happen. Now dressed in a dark suit, the better to show no stains. Francis Harrison looks up from his tablet with a smug smile on his face. He smells, he smells as if his jealousy against John will soon be put to end once his art with the system gets the printer to the gallows so much sooner. For how many lawyers will want to champion any cause knowing that disbarment is inevitable? 
Judge Delancey is all too amused with himself. Mr. Zanger, I do suggest you petition for new counsel. Turning to James Alexander and William Smith, John Peter Zenger has a look of a man asking why he was betrayed. A single candlelight illuminates the cold cell. The whistling winds can be heard through the glass over the barred window. John Peter Zenger is livid and he stands there confronting James Alexander and William Smith. How could you let this happen? John, occasionally a few knights must be put at risk to tip the hand of the opposing king, replies William Smith. John Peter Zenger looks at James Alexander. He's playing chess! This my life! This gambit was necessary to get you a jury, says James Alexander dryly. When you make petition for a new council, request John Chambers suggests William Smith with a confident nod. He has been advised of your case, adds James Alexander. You planned this? snaps John Peter Zenger. What game are you two playing now? The law, John, replies William Smith. Does Anna know you're doing this? James Alexander smiles confidently. I have always prided myself with being able to reason with a woman. Enraged, Anna slams her fist into a pile of newspapers and sends them flying like a cyclone. James Alexander and William Smith look to each other as if wondering where else they went wrong. Anna advances on the two men and shadows them. This is my husband's life you're toying with. William Smith is quick to empathize. Anna, I understand your grief. How the hell do you do? Anna, understand this. They planned all along to try John without a jury, explains James Alexander in desperation to retake the situation. He'd be dead by now if they had, and you bloody know it. John sent his petition through, adds William Smith. A friend of ours is taking over the case. What friend? William Smith looks to James Alexander as if saying, Go ahead, you tell her. James Alexander puts a calm smile and hopes his ribcage does not end up like that pile of newspapers on the floor. Mr. Chambers is a court-appointed defender and an expert bargainer. He knows the judges will not depart the case. What we have to do is not let those judges decide the case, advises William Smith. Anna is trying to hold in her grief and is convulsively bawling her fists. She shakes her head, sneers, and looks to the, two, to the two lawyers. How can I trust you? The bells jingle as the front door opens and Lewis Morris enters, followed by an elderly, elder gentleman, John Chambers from Philadelphia. Anna looks at the bookish Mr. Chambers and has to wonder how long it will be before judges Delancey and Phillips eat his case and spit him out along with Smith and Alexander. Good evening all, says Lewis Morris with a joyous tone in his voice. Mrs. Enger, I would like to, for you to meet a friend, Mr. John Chambers. John Chambers smiles and extends his hand to Anna. A pleasure, Mrs. Enger. Not knowing what to make of him, Anna shakes hands with John Chambers and finds his grip quite sturdy. He looks around the print shop to see the freshly printed newspapers hanging on the clotheslines, then looks to Anna. James Alexander and William Smith appear relieved by John Chambers' timely arrival. You should, you should know that Benjamin Franklin has seen personally to the circulation of your journal in Philadelphia, says John Chambers. Our compliments on your dedication. Th thank you, Mr. Chambers replies Anna as she watches him walk down the center of the shop, reviewing the drying newspapers. John Chambers turns to Anna and nods. I should like you to know that we've made considerable pro progress this day. What progress? asks Anna. All she knew was that 13 hours ago her husband's counsels were disbarred. 
She had not seen what Chambers had completed since his arrival this afternoon. Do we get a jury? asks James Alexander. That we do, James, replies John Chambers. We go to trial on August 4th. As expected, Delancey and Phillips will preside. August 4th, thought Anna, as the breath went out of her lungs. Five more months of this. Why drag this out so long? What other game do the governor's pawns have in mind to play in the meantime? And how long would John hold out? This was intolerable. When do they strike the jury? asks William Smith. The evening of July 29th, replies John Chambers. William Smith had to know more. Will you be present at the selection? John Chambers replies with a nod. I can. If one, Francis Harrison, is present among you, do be alert, warns James Alexander. You still expect treachery, asks John Chambers rhetorically. We expect the sharks to frenzy, replies William Smith. John Chambers uh, sighs. I do pity an animal who is its own worst enemy. Anna is looking at the lawyers, wondering what else they're up to when John Chambers pulls a book of legal precedents from his, his uh, leather bag. He does not even have to check the contents or the index, but rather turns, turns large numbers of pages and moves toward the middle of the book. Now then, good people, does anyone remember the decision of Chief Justice Holt? James Alexander and William Smith crack smiles. Anna looks at them as if wondering why. John Chambers puts her worries aside by turning the book so that she might see Holt's decision. This will interest you. She reads the case and the decision for several seconds, and then it's... It's her time to smile. Now does she understand everything. The procedure, the high stakes, and the probable results. Sitting on the edge of his bunk, John Peter Zenger is chuckling to himself as yet another prisoner is tossed into the next cell. The door slams. The locks tumble. The footsteps lumber away. He counts twelve on his fingers. And he shakes his head. I, I didn't do anything. Is there anyone out there? Do say something. In mischievous tone, does Zenger reply, Fresh fish. Chapter 20. Tuesday, July 29th, 1735. The courtroom is candlelit and the last rays of summer sun fade over the rooftops visible through the tall windows. Smiling, Francis Harrison watches the emotionally blank Mr. Worrell turn to John Chambers holding a list of 48 names. John Chambers takes the list, glances at it, and then at Francis Harrison. This seems too easy. I suppose it would be unnecessary for me to ask if these names were struck from the freeholders book, says John Chambers with but a hint of question in his voice. Mr. Worrell is quick with a plight. Um, um, oh, but, but of course they were. Yes. Mr. Worrell's eyes dart to Francis Harrison, then back at John Chambers, who stares at him and smiles, knowing he's already caught Worrell in his deceptions. John Chambers quickly reads the names, all of them too familiar, and shakes his head once. Of course they are, says John Chambers sarcastically. If it is not too great an imposition, I should like to copy this list. Again, does Mr. Wall exchange nervous glance with Mr. Francis Harrison? Surely that is not a problem, gentlemen, asks John Chambers. Mr. Wall nearly bites his tongue and blurts, uh, the, the, the Chief Justice, Francis Harrison is quick to recover. The Chief Justice would, would prefer, John Chambers is quicker to intercept. Would prefer not to have a mistrial declared to a hostile. No! A biased jury against my client. This will take but a moment. Pulling a piece of paper and a charcoal pencil from his case, John Chambers rapidly writes down all 48 names. Francis Harrison looks to Mr. Worrell, 
who has lost his cold demeanor and is now biting his nails. Completing his own copy, John Chambers hands the list back to Francis Harrison. His smug smile dashed. Harrison snatches it back. He knows all too well what the learned Mr. Chambers will find as he researches each one of those 48 names. Thank you very much, gentlemen, says John Chambers. Now, might I see the Freeholders book? Why, why, why certainly not, snaps Francis Harrison. Gentlemen, you raise my suspicions, says John Chambers. It is proper duty to my client that I verify the status of these 48 persons. You, you, you're requesting a jury, and, 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 and I did assemble you eight and forty names, snaps Francis Harrison. From this, you need select the twelve. Then you refused to entertain my objections, asks John Chambers. I do, Counselor, replies Francis Harrison. Smiling, John Chambers takes three steps toward the two brats. Harrison and Worrell take five steps back and bump into the banister. John Chambers is satisfied at their nervousness. When I was your age, I might have retaliated in most vulgar fashion at this injustice. But in my old age, wisdom tells me to pity you. And with that does he turn and walk down the aisle. Not understanding what is transpiring, Mr. Worrell looks to Francis Harrison, then takes several cautious steps after the briskly departing John Chambers. Mr. Chambers calls Mr. Worrell. Expecting this reaction, John Chambers Stops walking and turns to Mr. Worrell with a polite smile on his face. I, I, I would know. I, I would know. Why do you pity us? Asks Mr. Worrell. Because you are but cogs in a broken clock. Fast winding down, replies John Chambers as he steps toward Mr. Worrell. And once inert, this clock will be history. Be history. Never remember it. What will history say of Misters Harrison and Worrell? Not much. With a shrug, John Chambers turns and walks out of the room. Puzzled, Mr. Worrell looks back to Francis Harrison. The idiot is not even certain is if he's been insulted. Chapter 21, Wednesday, July 30, 1735. Interest in the case had not waned at all over the, the past few months, and once again was the courtroom packed to capacity. Oddly enough, it was more working class folk than the well-off who were more in attendance for it, as it is they who had the most to lose. All eyes were on John Chambers as he stands beside John Peter Zinger, holding high the list of 48 names made only last night. Please to understand, Your Honors, it is not my intent to incite incendiary accusation. I am certain the selection of these 48 names was an honest mistake on the part of Mr. Worrell and Harrison. A mistake? How so, Mr. Chambers? asks Judge Delancey. John Chambers explains, Your Honor, I made inquiry into the origins and status of these 48 persons. Imagine my surprise to learn that none of them were struck from the freeholder's book. The judges cannot help but hear the spectators grumbling their dissatisfaction and learning once again how the magistrates are doing a disservice against the Zenger family. Judge Phillips is about to grab his gavel and slam it. But John Chambers just glances back at the spectators as if saying, wait, there's more. The spectators grow quiet in anticipation. 
John Chambers turns to them and goes on. They are in fact persons holding commissions and offices at the governor's pleasure. Right. These people are in fact the governor's tailor, baker, joiner, shoemaker, candlemaker, blacksmith, etc., etc., etc. The spectators grumble much louder this time. Frantically, Judge Phillips grabs his gavel and slams it hard. Let us have order in this court! The spectators only go silent when John Chambers holds up a finger and then points at Francis Harrison. When I made request to see the freeholders book, Mr. Harrison not only denied me, but also refused me objections to those on the list. Preparing to make excuses, Francis Harrison stands and turns to the judges. John Chambers just shoots him a gaze of his displeasure, causing him to shrink back into his chair beside Richard Bradley. John Chambers turns to address the judges. Your Honors, in view of this embarrassing situation, I should like to res request strikeout of the jurors. Hoping to salvage something of their credibility, the judges barely take two seconds to exchange glances and come with the same decision. Judge Delancey nods to John Chambers and forces a smile. Mr. Chambers, in the interest of justice, I will allow you to strike out 12 jurors from the list. John Chambers is not amused by the judge's games. Your honors must realize that that would leave 36 partial and hostile men. Why, the results would be the two of you presiding over a star chamber in the guise of a jury trial. The spectators grumble to the point of becoming unruly. Judge Delancey slams his gavel twice. I will have order or I will clear this court. Your Honors, I would request a motion to order 48 names struck from the freeholders book. And further, that the clerk, John Chambers gestures at Francis Harrison, should hear objections and allow exceptions as is just. Tight-lipped and cloaking their seething anger, the judges look down at Francis Harrison and then watch him swallow a lump in his throat. They are actually in disbelief how the clerk could have mishandled things so completely and then allowed it to be made public knowledge. The judges are now in a position where they must prevent the public from rioting and also win the case against John Peter Zenger and save their position of favor with their governor. They are now in the vice. A pleasant smile on his face. John Chambers nods to John Peter Zenger and then turns to the judges. Despite scoring against Harrison, he realizes he must give the judges the opportunity to save some face so that he might gain some distance from this act later. However, in the event the judges attempt further injustice, he makes preparation for motions in that direction too. He looks to see Judge Delancey struggling to twist his sneer into a twitching smile. From this, he can begin to do the judge's next move. Ah, uh, Mr. Chambers, uh, you, you make a case well, says Judge Delancey in a capitulating gesture. In the spirit of cooperation, I grant your motion and order 48 names to be struck for the freeholder's book. Both yourself and the prosecution will furnish a list of 12 men to serve as jurors on the morning of August 4th. That is satisfactory? That much is, Your Honors, replies John Chambers. But one thing further. Recognizing the legality of the defense counsel's exceptions, I bid you rethink your decision that left Mr. Alexander and Smith disparate. And having done so, do return them to their offices forthwith. The judges actually expected this from Chambers. 
But that didn't mean they would not feel more nausea at the prospect of reinstating two lawyers whose position toward the state was allegedly, but not proven hostile. They tried to show some outward control over the situation by slowly nodding and forcing smiles. Judge Delancey drags in a slow, deep breath while choosing words for his reply. This we will consider, Mr. Chambers. John Chambers takes a slight bow to the judges. And that, your honors, is all I need ask. Then, with all parties satisfied, this court is adjourned! Bailiff! Judge Delancey slams his head. He watches John Peter Zenger shake hands with John Chambers, yet over the clamor of the approving mob, he cannot hear what the two are saying. The fact that the spectators are no longer grumbling and clenching their fists, however, gives him some ease despite his losses this hour. Noticing the judge's eye on him, John Peter Zenger turns his back to them and speaks with John Chambers. Well, met, Mr. Chambers. The practice of law is not unlike brinksmanship, Mr. Zenger. You did put one across Mr. Harris's bow, sir, says John Peter Zenger. This was only round three. How many rounds have we? John Chambers points to the main doors of the courtroom. We will keep fighting until you walk out of those doors. What if they disbar you too? I have casual acquaintances in New Jersey, offers John Chambers. Lawyers? Freemasons, replies John Chambers with a sly smile. He watches as the two redcoat guards march through the arch door, cross the floor and stand on either side of John Peter Zenger. He smirks and eyes the redcoats with slight regard. Rest easy, son. Justice will be done. Nodding, John Peter Zenger turns and walks out with the redcoats. Closing up his attaché case, John Chambers walks over to the prosecutor's desk and eclipses young Francis Harrison in his shadow. Young man, I would see that book now. With the expression of a defeated man, Francis Harrison reaches into the small desk cabinet and produces the leather-bound Freeholder's Book. John Chambers snaps his out of his hands and eyes the binding. The binding is marked as having been printed in 1732, three years ago. With a devious smile, John Chambers causes the binding to emit a cracking sound as he opens the book. He looks down at Francis Harrison with disdain. That freeholder's book had never been opened before. Ah, oh, to our three-year-old book cracks anew, Mr. Harrison. Francis Harrison is nauseatingly disgusted. He has spent the day feeling his stomach grind because of his public defeat. He has spent the day planning a harsh reprisal that looks like a legal procedure. He knows he cannot take the fight to Chambers. The Rook is too fast and too smart. The Knights are about to be reinstated, giving more threat. Striking at pawns is useless. He must take this fight to the Queen before she prints another issue of the journal. Giving, give her something more to struggle with so that she'll be too occupied to print another issue. And he has chosen his own pawns to do the job and sent message for them to arrive at sunset. Yet, it is hours past sunset and he has waited, vulnerable, in this alley beside the courthouse for their arrival. Finally, does the rear door of the courthouse open and Sheriff John Sines exits with his two redcoats. Francis Harrison turns to his pawns with a fixed sneer on his young face. You can't be waiting, Mr. Sines! Sheriff John Sines is tired and surly. I had to record the debriefing of your latest informant. Why do you summon me at this hour? 
The governor and I are concerned about the health and welfare of the Zenger children, replies Frances Harrison. Anna Zenger's devotion to her husband's business has her neglecting her parental duties. So prance around the bush for me, Harrison. Over with it! Francis Harrison could sense Sheriff Symes' impatience. You will present Anna Zenger with a writ in the morning and take up her children. There are beds and work for them at the shoe polish company. Aye, there is, agrees the first red coat. Sheriff John Symes turns to see the, the approving smile on the face of the first red coat. This whole thing feels wrong to him. He sneers and advances on Francis Harrison till his shadow eclipses the little, little tyrant. No, Mr. Harrison, I will not! Francis Harrison feels his stomach churn again and tastes the hot bile rising up in his larynx. He cannot tolerate the fireman's. What? what did you say to me, Irishman? You heard me, snaps Sheriff Sines. I've broken commandments enough for your cronies, so you can thin out the herd. I was a stupid man to think your wealth, your position, put you in the moral right. Outraged, he shoots the redcoats a hard stare. But this! The redcoats watch as Sheriff Sines steps forwards and bumps Francis Harrison with his chest, knocking him back three steps. They exchange glances as if wondering which man to show loyalty to. The angry Irishman, or the cold British Italian butt in the plum paisley. There are few tasks lower than taking an honest lady's children, admonishes Sheriff Sines as he shoves his finger into Harris's chest, and no slug lower than you to order it done. Francis Harrison tries to act like he's not intimidated by sighing as if bored by the sheriff's defiance. <sighs> Disobedience is not an option. Carry out your duties or your commission is forfeit. I'll do you one better! Angrily, Sheriff Sign pulls his badge from his jacket and turns on the first redcoat. I heard you whispering about what promotion, boy. The first redcoat is, is shocked. He had no idea the sheriff could have heard him weeks ago talking about what he'd do if he were in charge as sheriff. And the first red coat has no time to react. Sheriff Sines shoves the badge pins through the first red coat's uniform, through his white blouse, and embeds it in the yelping man's chest. Then, with a ball of fist, Sheriff Sines pans the badge hard, driving it the pins deeper into the first red coat's flesh. Blood spurts onto the white blouse. Oh, take it, you bastard! Francis Harrison can only gasp. The second red coat steps back, not knowing what to do. Again, John Symes punches the badge pins deeper into the first red coat's flesh, causing more blood to spurt. Blood stripes! Wear him in good health! The first red coat whimpers, trembles, and is shoved up against the brick wall by John Symes. Startled, Francis Harrison shoots a look to the second red coat, as if asking him why he's not doing anything. John Sines punctuates his statement with a punch to the jaw that sends the first red coat sprawling to the wet cobblestone. The beat man clutches his bloody chest and whines. Francis Harrison sinks back in a silent retreat. Turning rapidly, John Sines grabs Francis Harrison, spins him off the cobblestones, and holds him up against the brick wall with one arm. Oh, you're afraid now, ain't you? Ain't you? You send your red coat politician on your foul errand, Harrison. Howls John Sines. I have resigned. Francis Harrison suddenly feels that familiar heaviness in his bowels. He can only hope his bladder holds. He gasps in a breath through his nose and wheezes in his words. I understand what you sacrifice. You want to carry out this errand, however foul. If you fail. You, you, you will no longer be in favor with our governor. How will you earn your keep? Oh, don't worry. I built a fine house before and will again. John Symes 
waltz away, leaving Francis Harrison to flop on the wet cobblestones. The, quickly does Francis Harren, Harrison leap to his feet, dust himself off, and fakes a laugh to save face. Oh, oh, a carpenter, making homes that you'll never afford to buy for yourself. What a meager existence you will have, John Symes. At the mouth of the alley, John Symes turns to Francis Harrison with a smile on his tired face. Being a carpenter. It was good enough for Jesus Christ. So it's good enough for John Symes. The second red coat can only watch John Symes walk out of the alley into the candlelit street beyond. He looks at Francis Harrison, who is defeated. Francis Harrison looks at the first red coat, groaning on the cobblestones and plucking the badge pins out of the two, two holes in his chest. He stomps his foot impatiently. Well, get on your feet, man, snaps Francis Harrison. You, you both, you both have work to do. Shut off, snaps the second red coat, grabbing the first red coat's arm, the second pulls him to his feet, and the two stagger out of the alley, leaving Francis Harrison alone. Francis Harrison looks up and across the street to see the silhouettes in each of the apartment windows. <laughs> each of them watching and laughing at him. And now he has to walk home with all of those eyes watching him. And part three.